Welcome to the Alcon Experience Academy, your one-stop resource for training, product information, and much more. The Alcon Experience Academy is a great resource for any healthcare professional who engages with the eye, including ophthalmologists, optometrists, nurses, technicians, and students. If staying up to date on products, services, techniques, and training taught by professionals from around the world is important to you, the Alcon Experience Academy should be your go-to source. Let's take a look. This scrolling banner will immediately let you know what's new. Content of interest can be customized by you to show the latest content based on your personal preferences, whether by an area of focus or by specific topics of interest. This engaging content comes from some of the leading specialists from around the world. Recently added content will show the newest resources added to the site, allowing you to explore some of the latest innovations in eye care. My Courses is where you will find courses for your specific needs. It also shows the courses you have taken and completed and those courses you are still in the process of completing. In addition to other helpful tools, additional resources will point you to more than 100 informative FAQ videos on Alcon technology. My Events shows you a calendar of the upcoming webinars or face-to-face -face training events that you've signed up to attend. Now let's take a look at some features of the Alcon Experience Academy. Accessibility. Gain access to the content you need when you need it. The mobile-friendly format allows you to access content on the go. Usability. Ease of use on every step of your informational journey. Navigation. Move easily from one topic to the next, from one piece of content to the next. Searchability. Find what you need fast. Trackability. Keep track of the modules you've completed, ones you still need to complete, and exactly where you are in the modules you've started. Robust content. Over 500 training videos, with additional content being added all the time. Getting started is easy. Simply register at alconexperienceacademy.com and gain access to all of this content today. Sustain Complete Lubricant Eye Drops offer all-in-one relief for irritated dry eyes. For patients with any type of dry eye, this revolutionary formula hydrates and protects all layers of the tear film. The unique HP Guar-based formulation contains polar phospholipids and mineral oil in the form of tiny nano-sized droplets. As Sustain Complete spreads across the ocular surface, the small nano-sized lipid droplets cover more ocular surface area. Upon installation, HP Guar forms a hydrophilic meshwork, cross-linking with the mucoaqueous layer, creating a protective elastic matrix. This enhanced meshwork allows for slow release of lipid nanodroplets. These nano-sized lipid droplets migrate to replenish the top lipid layer of the tear film repairing gaps and providing more complete coverage of the lipid layer. That's how Sustain Complete Lubricant Eye Drops hydrate and protect the mucoaqueous and lipid layers of the tear film. Help your patients feel unstoppable with the all-in-one relief of Sustain Complete. Two drops, one unstoppable you. For your next cataract procedure, you're invited to the ultimate experience of control and clarity. The Clarion IOL with the Autonomy Delivery System. Autonomy is the first and only automated, disposable, preloaded IOL delivery system. With its innovative CO2 power delivery mechanism, Autonomy brings the predictable precision of automation to every delivery of the Clarion Aspheric IOL. The device takes just three steps to prepare. Fill the device with an Alcon qualified viscoelastic. Remove the lockout assembly and use your thumb to advance the plunger and fold the IOL up to the pause location. 
Once the lens is in the pause location, confirm that the lens is properly folded and deliver it within one minute. The ergonomic design fits comfortably in your hand for intuitive control of the device during delivery. While the responsive speed control lever enables easy, single-handed control of IOL advancement. With its proprietary depth guard, autonomy protects incisions as small as 2.2 millimeters. During delivery, you can vary the plunger speed at any time by adjusting the pressure on the speed control lever. Simply press the lever with your index finger to advance the plunger and deliver the IOL, ensuring that the leading haptic is properly placed within the eye as you implant the lens. It's that easy to deliver the Clarion IOL, a lens with a new hydrophobic acrylic biomaterial of unsurpassed clarity. Built with the exceptional bio-optics and biomechanics of Alcon IOLs, Clarion features an advanced IOL design with a fully usable 6mm aspheric optic dedicated to sharp, crisp vision from edge to edge. Produced with an advanced manufacturing process, Clarion also features a precision edge design. This design includes a proprietary edge curvature that reduces edge glare, as well as a continuous posterior barrier that guards against PCO and minimizes MD-YAG procedures. Stable force haptics give Clarion exceptional axial stability across a range of capsule sizes with minimal axial shift and maximum refractive predictability. With its ultra-smooth optic, Clarion delivers unsurpassed clarity from the start with among the lowest level of surface haze. And with its new microvacuole resistant hydrophobic acrylic biomaterial, Clarion delivers unsurpassed clarity that lasts. This is a truly pristine premium IOL, delivered with easy, intuitive control. Together, Clarion Autonomy is the ultimate IOL delivery experience. In 1976, a picture from outer space sparked the world's imagination. NASA's Viking 1 sent an image of what appeared to be a human face on the surface of Mars. The story took on mythical proportions. Many took it as proof that alien life existed. But it would be decades before improved technology would let them take a better picture. Innovative technology like 3D visualization can help you see reality and transform your surgical experience. Discover the wonders of 3D visualization technology from Mars to your operating room. It's time to take another look. Welcome to the Alcon Experience Academy, your one-stop resource for training, product information, and much more. The Alcon Experience Academy is a great resource for any healthcare professional who engages with the eye, including ophthalmologists, optometrists, nurses, technicians, and students. If staying up to date on products, services, techniques, and training taught by professionals from around the world is important to you, the Alcon Experience Academy should be your go-to source. Let's take a look. This scrolling banner will immediately let you know what's new. Content of interest, 
can be customized by you to show the latest content based on your personal preferences, whether by an area of focus or by specific topics of interest. This engaging content comes from some of the leading specialists from around the world. Recently added content will show the newest resources added to the site, allowing you to explore some of the latest innovations in eye care. My Courses is where you will find courses for your specific needs. It also shows the courses you have taken and completed and those courses you are still in the process of completing. In addition to other helpful tools, additional resources will point you to more than 100 informative FAQ videos on Alcon technology. My Events shows you a calendar of the upcoming webinars or face-to-face -face training events that you've signed up to attend. Now let's take a look at some features of the Alcon Experience Academy. Accessibility. Gain access to the content you need when you need it. The mobile-friendly format allows you to access content on the go. Usability. Ease of use on every step of your informational journey. Navigation. Move easily from one topic to the next, from one piece of content to the next. Searchability. Find what you need fast. Trackability. Keep track of the modules you've completed, ones you still need to complete, and exactly where you are in the modules you've started. Robust content. Over 500 training videos, with additional content being added all the time. Getting started is easy. Simply register at alconexperienceacademy.com and gain access to all of this content today. Sustain Complete Lubricant Eye Drops offer all-in-one relief for irritated dry eyes. For patients with any type of dry eye, this revolutionary formula hydrates and protects all layers of the tear film. The unique HP Guar-based formulation contains polar phospholipids and mineral oil in the form of tiny nano-sized droplets. As Sustain Complete spreads across the ocular surface, the small nano-sized lipid droplets cover more ocular surface area. Upon installation, HP Guar forms a hydrophilic meshwork, cross-linking with the mucoaqueous layer, creating a protective elastic matrix. This enhanced meshwork allows for slow release of lipid nanodroplets. These nano-sized lipid droplets migrate to replenish the top lipid layer of the tear film repairing gaps and providing more complete coverage of the lipid layer. That's how Sustain Complete Lubricant Eye Drops hydrate and protect the mucoaqueous and lipid layers of the tear film. Help your patients feel unstoppable with the all-in-one relief of Sustain Complete. Two drops, one unstoppable you. In 1976, a picture from outer space sparked the world's imagination. NASA's Viking 1 sent an image of what appeared to be a human face on the surface of Mars. The story took on mythical proportions. Many took it as proof that alien life existed. But it would be decades before improved technology would let them take a better picture. Innovative technology like 3D visualization can help you see reality and transform your surgical experience. Discover the wonders of 3D visualization technology from Mars to your operating room. It's time to take another look.
Good afternoon, everyone. It's that time of the week once again, and we all know what that means, right? It's time for another interesting ITV episode. So it is my privilege to welcome you all to episode 21 of TMC ITV. I am Dr. Glenn Angeles, and I invite all of you to join us this afternoon for another virtual learning opportunity. The cataract section of the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute, in partnership with Alcon, has prepared a four-episode special for all of you. Welcome to the TMC Alcon Impact Program, Episode 1. For the first episode, we will be getting to the root of the matter. Why learn how to implant toric lenses? But before we go further, let us begin our program by hearing from Mr. Samrat Joshi, the Surgical Commercial Head and Country Manager of our sponsor for this episode, Alcon, for his opening remarks. Hi everyone. Dear doctors, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the entire Department of Ophthalmology within Medical City to come up with such a highly scientific content on ITV which will not only limit it to Philippines, but also is going to be broadcasted and extended to other countries where the important topic of astigmatism management is covered in the series of ITV. Kudos to Alcon team to closely coordinate with the important stakeholders within the hospital and facilitating such an important program. Once again, I would like to warmly con congratulate the entire Department of Ophthalmology in Medical City and I wish you all the very best and have a great time ahead. Thank you, Mr. Joshi, for that warm welcome for our viewers. And thank you, Alcon, for teaming up with us to offer our viewers a segment that would be relevant to the times. Again, I would like to remind our viewers that this month is Sight Saving Month. This is our small contribution in improving the eye health of our patients and specifically our countrymen, hopefully by further improving the outcomes of cataract surgery. Also, please be reminded that this webinar series is just one half of the whole IMPACT program. The culmination is actually being able to perform an actual toric surgery, which is institution-based, just as what we have started here in the medical city for our junior consultants and residents. All right, let's cut to the chase. Again, in everything that we do, there is always a purpose, a why. So to begin our impact program, let us hear from none other but our chairman himself on the why of toric lens implantation. Our first speaker is none other than our institute director and one of the minds behind the conceptualization of this learning platform, Dr. Victor Caparas. Dr. Caparas, our big boss here at the Medical City, is also the head of the cornea and external disease section. He obtained his medical degree at the University of Philippines College of Medicine and subsequently took his ophthalmology residency at the Philippine General Hospital where he, is, he was also the chief resident. Dr. Caparas did his cornea fellowship at the Shepens Eye Research Institute at Harvard Medical School in Boston. He is one of the founders and a past president of the Philippine Cornea Society. If you have questions, do not hesitate to type them down in our chat box, and we will try our best to accommodate all questions during the Q&A later on. Without further ado, let us now give the floor to Dr. Vic Caparas. Uh, 
Um, and thank you uh, to the audience for uh, coming over and um, tuning in again to ITV. Uh, as you know, ITV was is the child of the pandemic, and it was made uh, necessary because we couldn't see each other. But we found that it's such um, an effective tool to reach many people at different places, even far from the hospital. And it's now become our preferred uh, tool for uh, education. Uh, as Dr. Glenn mentioned, this is the first part of a series of educational videos um, to basically accredit a surgeon to use a toric IOL. The second phase of that would be for you to actually do the surgery and uh, implant the toric IOL. But it's very important that you attend these didactics because you will find that there's really not much to learn in terms of technique, but the theoretical aspect of it is actually the more critical and crucial factors. So I've titled my lecture, Why Use a Toric IOL? Because it seems that here in the Philippines and even outside the Philippines, there is still a bit of skepticism and maybe some even resistance to using it. But uh, let me show you my take on it, having used a Toric IOL since its introduction to the Philippines in 2007 and having lectured on it many, many times uh, here and abroad. Um, and how, but more importantly, how it has helped my practice and how it has led to an improvement in uh, outcomes, improvement in patient satisfaction, and therefore uh, an advancement in the success of my clinic. You, you may remember the COMSA, Center for Ophthalmic Microsurgical Skills Advance. Many of you may not know that this was done in conjunction with Alcon. So it's customary to thank the sponsor at the end of the show. But because Alcon has become so uh, involved in the training of so many of our ophthalmologists in the Philippines, not only at the medical city, it's only right that we give them their proper due. The COMSA was started around 2007, 2008 with the help of Alcon. And we trained many, many, not just young residents and graduates, but even older graduates who did not have the fortune to have FACO training in their residency. And many of the consultants at TMC now quite a number have actually had actually passed through this program and are now successful sur uh, FACO surgeons. So we closed up this program several years ago because there was no need for it. People were already uh, good at FACO and there were many places to learn it. So now it's the next step and it's called the Alcon Impact. And it's actually a mnemonic which means improving patient outcomes with toric IOL. So why give so much importance to toric IOL? Well, we aim to make you successful. Any residency training program, fellowship training program, would like to see its graduates become successful practitioners. So who exactly are these successful doctors? Number one, they should be masters of the technique. They should be highly confident with their technique in doing phaco emulsification, being able to deal with all sorts of cataract and all sorts of complications. Number two, these are doctors who focus on quality in the delivery of their services from the time the patient checks into their clinic to the time that they're operated and to the aftercare. And these are patient doctors who deliver excellent patient outcomes and excellent patient satisfaction. These are doctors who continue to learn year after year after year to keep pace with advances. 
And I can use myself as an example. I did not learn FACO emulsification in my residency. In fact, I learned it maybe 15 years after I graduated. But we had to do it. If you were to be able to continue to practice successfully, if your ambition was to become a good and successful practitioner, there is no other recourse but to keep up with the science. Very critical also are those doctors who are successful, they have access to the appropriate technology. Okay? So we can't really be talking about multifocal lenses and toric lenses if you don't have the necessary equipment, the necessary biometers, and maybe even the markers. And therefore, access to this is very important. And those surgeons who have easy access to this, such as those who are based in tertiary hospitals, should have the advantage here. But I can tell you from several graduates of our COMSA program uh, that these, patient, these uh, doctors have the ambition to succeed and they acquired uh, their own technology, their own equipment, because they wanted to keep up. And this is, should not be a... Uh, barrier to, to people learning new techniques. And finally, a successful surgeon is that is one who adapts to, the, to change at the critical time to be able to differentiate himself or herself from the competition. What do I mean by that? In um, business school, um, they will teach you something called the technology adoption life cycle, okay? And as you can see with, uh, with this chart, on the far left, you have the innovators, the people who actually make the changes, who invent something, and who have the, uh, who have the capacity to, to create something new. And then the next group, will be the visionaries, the ones who see the advantage, the benefit of this new technology, and therefore put it into their practices. So we also call them early adopters. And then we have the pragmatists, the ones who see the early adopters and they, they postponed a little bit just to see if things work and then jump on the bandwagon. And then here, later on, we have the late majority, the conservative thinking doctors who will only, maybe the doubting pharmacists who will only be convinced once they see many, many cases that are successful and no complications. And finally, we have the skeptics. Those, despite the mountain of, the mountain of evidence that they see, they seem to take their time, or maybe even refuse to, to, to change for a variety of reasons. Now, you will see in between the visionaries and the pragmatists, there's what we call as the chasm. The chasm is important because that's the key point at which, in my view, it divides the successful from the not-so-successful practices. Because crossing the chasm means that you will jump on to the opportunity for growth, for faster growth and, mark and success. Okay? So it's a leap okay, from something that is not re relatively well known yet to get ahead of the pack. Okay? So like in business schools, they say, you know, if... Uh, housewives are already buying a stock, then that stock is already, uh, it's time to sell your stock, okay? Because if it has already leached into the great majority, then that stock is not going to grow anymore. It's the same thing with technology. And I dare say the same thing in cataract practice. When I started uh, lecturing on toric lenses, um, we referred a lot to the ASCRS Clinical Practices Survey. 
And at that time, I showed this slide, and I've shown this slide many, many times. And uh, if you see from 2007, uh, when it was introduced uh, in the U.S., maybe a year or two before 2007, um, these were the uh, other uh, modalities to, to uh, address a stigma, uh, astigmatism in their cataract uh, patients. So as you can see, LRI was quite popular among the respondents from 2007 and even in 2008. But you can see that uh, the early adopters of the toric lenses grew by double by the next year. You see how fast the adoption took, and these are mostly U.S. respondents. In our institution at the TMC, it, it's not that way. In fact, the, the growth of toric practice it's more or less flat, okay? And also it's uh, confined to maybe three or even four surgeons. The rest will do it once or twice and then not at all, or even not at all. It's however um, heartwarming to see that the growth of premium lenses at all, which includes uh, press biopic uh, correction lenses is growing. Um, but it's also troubling to see that while it's growing, the toric lenses, which you see, uh, should uh, comprise about 30 to 40 percent of those total premium lenses, is only about maybe um, one one fifth or 15 percent. So we're compiling these statistics yearly, and you can refer to us. Uh, if you want to know uh, 2020 and 2021. So how, how are the other countries doing? How is the U.S. doing? How, is the, uh, how are the non-U.S. countries outside the Philippines doing? Well, the last uh, clinical survey of the ASCRS in 2019, um, it showed that 40% of surgeons would implant a toric IOL in one-fifth of their eligible patients. Uh, it's a little higher in the U.S., a little lower in non-U.S., but the average is about 20%, which is much higher than what we saw in the late 2000s and definitely higher than what we're seeing in our hospital and I would uh, project outside TNC. In fact, in the U.S. and elsewhere, they're already debating on how low an amount of astigmatism you should correct with an IOL. And uh, the, the survey in 2018 showed that about 15% of surgeons would uh, implant it on a patient who had cylinder of uh, three quarters of a diopter. Okay. Right? So it's, up, it's already at that level where you're already... Uh, seeing how low uh, or how high you need to correct it. And I know several surgeons here and abroad who will even correct less than 0.75, uh, especially those who implant multifocal and presbyopia correcting lenses. They will correct as low as half a diopter. In Europe, it's, it's pretty much the same. The growth has been slow and steady, very gradual. But their results from the last survey in 2019 showed that about 13% are implanting it uh, in those patients who, have, uh, who are eligible to receive it. And if cost were not an issue, more than half of those cataract patients would have received a toric IOL. That's the opinion of all the European uh, ESCRS members. In fact, they even broke it down. So you have more granular data with patients with 1.25 cylinder, almost half would have received a toric, 1.75, two thirds, and definitely higher than that, 80, more than 
So you can see how it is so well uh, accepted in, in Europe. As for the reasons for not using authoric IUL, we're back in the ASCRS. The number one concern, as I can tell you at the ESCRS, is the cost. And it would be the same here. Okay? And it, it, there's nothing that you can't hide it because it's a, a more expensive lens. And there is a reason why they call it a premium IOL. Okay? So that's one of the barriers to using a toric IOL for sure. Okay? So we have our own set of reasons. And this I have collected from the years that I have talked with doctors and lectured and been implanting um, uh, toric IOLs and teaching residents. And here, here are some of the more important or more popular reasons for not using a toric IOL. The first one is, I don't see much astigmatism in my cataract patients. Okay, let's look at that. This is a study made in Spain and it showed that 35% of patients of the, and these are patients in the cataract age, had more or equal to one diopter of astigmatism. So that's a big deal because that's more than a third of patients who will have significant amounts of astigmatism. And I'll show you why we call that a stig uh, significant astigmatism. Now, you might say that's just the Europeans. Here's an Asian sample, uh, which was collected by our friend Abe Vasabada from India. And he found that 25 to 30 percent of his patients had equal to or greater than one diopter of astigmatism. So the skeptics will say those are Indian eyes. Okay. Dr. Debbie Shapno and I did a study back in 2009, which we never really got to publish, but we still have it. And this is what we found, that similar to the Europeans and similar to uh, the Indian studies, 36% of eyes had astigmatism of equal to or greater than one diopter. Additionally, we found that the older the cataract patient, the higher the astigmatism went, making it more, in case you were thinking of correcting it, more necessary. Okay. The next, quest, the next uh, excuse is, my patients don't complain about their astigmatism anyway. And they also say that, well, you know, those, those uh, patients are used to it. Well, I'll show you uh, later on. You see, uh, I'll point it out to you why they will. They would say that they're used to it. See, but uh, most many doctors will say, "Well, you know, di naman pinapansin ng pasyente ko, no?" Okay. Now, early on, when I was lecturing for Alcon about toric IUL, they used to have this gimmick, wherein they would hand out uh, pre-made. Uh, spectacles with uh, one diopter of a uh, cylinder attached to the lenses. And they would have uh, the audience wear these lenses. Okay, so if you didn't wear glasses, you put them on. If you wore glasses, you put them over your glasses. And basically, they would ask the audience, so how do you feel? And they would even get a little snarky and say, anytime you get dizzy, you're free to take it off. No? Okay, so that, that I felt was quite an effective tool, but we can't, obviously can't do that here. But let me show you this. Okay, so let me just show you this experiment that was done. Oh, um, this, is almost, this is more than 20 years ago. They used a laser optical bench. They um, induced astigmatism by putting a one diopter cylinder uh, between the IOL and the camera. And uh, the astigmatism was corrected by add, adding a minus one to correct the plus one cylinder in front of the IOL. Okay, so what did they see? If there was no astigmatism, the camera captured this uh, focus spot of light 
as you can see, it's pretty well defined, it's um, and solid, and it's not dispersed at all. No, okay. If you induce astigmatism, that's how you see, and depending on the uh, axis that you look at, you will have either a vertical or a horizontal spread of the light. And when you correct it with the proper cylinder, okay, that's how a patient will see it uh, when both uh, images are corrected. But when you correct the astigmatism, that's, that's how the light looks. So very similar to the top image. Okay, so um, I would challenge anybody to say that the middle image is far better than the top or the bottom image in terms of uh, definition, in terms of maybe even clarity. No? Okay. Then um, the Spanish, uh, these are physical, op uh, physical optics uh, physicists. They, they, they look at astigmatism and they found that it increased continuously after age 50, okay? And that it got higher and higher as one got older. And it coincided with uh, the progressive deterioration in visual acuity. So it's not the cataract causing it, it's the astigmatism. These patients have no cataract yet. See? So... Uh, blur increased as astigmatism increased, but the patients displayed some sort of neuroadaptation okay, in response to the increasing astigmatism because it doesn't occur very quickly. It occurs very gradually. So these patients sort of got used to it. Okay, That's why many doctors will say, well, these patients are used to it, so they don't complain about it. And that's the explanation. Okay? But if you correct that, okay, the patients will suddenly realize how clear their vision should be. And I'm sure any cataract surgeon has experienced that. Patients who claim that their vision is good, but actually have a cataract, and then you remove the cataract and they say, whoa, I can see so much better now. It's so much brighter and so much clearer, see? Uh, and I'm sure you've seen that. And this is also the reason for the wow factor. I'm sure you've heard that term. Putting in a toric IOL has a better, as a, for in my experience, has a greater wow factor than putting in a multifocal lens. Because these patients who have astigmatism, especially the higher degrees, have had it all their lives, and they don't know any other way of seeing. And despite using spectacles, obviously, it's not ideal, it's not optimal. But when you correct it in the eye with an IOL, they, they can see so much better, hence the wow factor. And that's something that you will not experience if you don't put a toric IOL. The next reason is I don't want to learn a new technique. It's too hard. It's too much trouble. I don't have the instruments. You know, Alcon won't give me a free marker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these are all valid in in certain instances. But let me show you something that a good friend of mine from Taiwan, uh, whom I met while doing these lectures, um, uh, showed me. You know, and he lent me a, a video. So these these special uh, markers are definitely very useful. And you don't have to have those digital markers like the Callisto and the Varian, actually. And these uh, are used by many, many doctors around the world. In fact, the majority of eye centers will not have a Callisto or a Varian, but will use this. Okay. So what we use, or what I used to use before we got a Varian and a Callisto, is that we just did it manually. So uh, we, we put... All we did was put a slit lamp in the OR, and as you can see, that's our slit lamp in the OR. And we prepare a marker. We used to use a needle before I bought a uh, fancier marker, but all you need is an alkane uh, gauge 23 needle on a syringe and a marking pen. And of course, your surgical plan. And this is the, 
this is the video that uh, Dr. Meng Sheng Wu from Kaohsiung lent me. So it's exactly what we do. We mark the 180 degree so that you have a, a point of reference like that. Mark it with a uh, gentian, well, the more special surgical marker. So as you can see, that's the horizontal. And then you can turn the axis to the desired um, axis for um, the IOL. And in this case, it's 10 degrees. And you mark it the same way. So, as you can see, this is the same patient that was marked. As you can see, those are my marks. And as you can see on the side, the surgical plan. And all you have to do is remove the cataract, insert the IOL, and rotate it so that it aligns to your marks. So you don't really need those fancy digital markers as long as you are meticulous in your technique in marking it. Okay. Another excuse is my patients prefer to have a multifocal. Yes, of course. Um, a lot of people would not like would like not to have to wear glasses anymore. Okay. And and that that that's not but it's not really a reason. Okay. Because um, many as you as you have seen, 30 to 40 percent of your patients who will theoretically be eligible for a multifocal will have astigmatism will have significant astigmatism. And we all know that astigmatism will really uh, cause a deterioration of your image when you use a multifocal lens, especially a diffractive multifocal lens, which is the most popular class of lens so far in the country. Okay, so again, that same, that same experiment where they passed a light um, through uh, an IOL and induced astigmatism. So this time they used a multifocal IOL, so near and distance. And then they induced astigmatism, as you can see. So you have a vertical and horizontal for distance, a vertical and horizontal for near. Okay. And that's how the final image will look with both eyes open. And then they corrected it. Okay, by putting in uh, a cylinder. Again, as you can see, the middle images are far inferior to ones without a uh, cylinder. Okay, so that is how uh, astigmatism will affect the results of your multifocal. So if you think you can get away by not correcting your astigmatism, especially high degrees, then you're mistaken. The next thing is, um, I don't use a toric IOL. I do limbal relaxing incisions, and mainly because it's cheaper. I agree with that. The LRIs are effective, but only to a certain extent. There are several disadvantages of the LRI. Aside, there is an increased endophthalmitis risk. There is increased risk to dry eye, and when you know, it's been around for a while. When long-term studies were done, they found out that LRIs are not as effective as why they claim, especially if you just blindly follow those popular nomograms, no? those uh, nomograms that are you can find on the internet. So if it's not optimized to your hand, then it's, it has been found that it's not as uh, effective. Okay. So just to... Uh, drive home the point, when you have more incisions, you therefore have more risk of leakage and you have therefore increased risk of endophthalmitis. Especially for those who do clear corneal incisions. Dry eye. Why will it cause dry eye? Again, the more incisions you have, the more corneal nerves you're going to disrupt. So in a FACO uh, 
surgery, you will have two incisions. But if you add LRI, let's say an opposing just across, if you do uh, just opposing your main incision, you will have a third. Or if it's a, another, then you will have actually four. Okay, so what happens is that even if you incise inferiorly or superiorly, you are going to you are going to disrupt the whole network because all of these ner uh, nerves are intertwined. Okay, and the greater the loss of corneal sensation, the greater the risk for postfacal dry eye. Now let's talk about effectivity. Um, the toric IOL versus what they call it, what they used to call as opposite clear corneal incisions, so mainly uh, LRIs as well. Okay, so the cylindrical power when you put in a toric IOL. So the way to understand this uh, these figures is that those uh, dots should be close to the central line. Okay, so there's not much spread when you use a toric IOL, but there's a distinctly wider spread of results when you use the corneal incisions, okay, in terms of cylindrical power at a certain axis. And on the 45 degrees away, it's the same uh, effect. And in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, spherical equivalence, you can see that the grouping, the grouping of the dots with the toric IOL it's much, it's much smaller than that with the uh, clear corneal incision. Okay. And finally, um, long-term studies of LRIs basically show that unless you're using your own personalized nomogram, okay, the LRIs, do not reach your target cylinder. So they're not as effective as you think they are or as you believe they are. And also, in my hands, there is some degradation of effect. So if initially you were able to correct one diopter, maybe a, a year or two later, it's only correcting maybe uh, a quarter or half in my hands. So number one reason is it's expensive. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of skeptics are waiting for this. Okay, so let me show you a different take on it. Um, there are many cost-benefit analyses of these IOLs, no? and this was done back in 2009. Okay, so this study basically showed that, yes, initially the cost of using a toric IOL is higher than if you put a mono monofocal and then just correcting with, with glasses. But over time, and I forget how many years this is, I think it's about five years, um, the toric IOL cost is actually lower. Okay, And this is not to mention the satisfaction of the patient because especially now, patients will ask, you know, why am I still wearing glasses? Shouldn't I not be wearing glasses? I had my cataract uh, removed already. How come my neighbor is not wearing glasses? I'm sure you've heard that from your patients. Okay. And then Europeans will show similar, um, similar savings in terms of lifetime costs in maintaining a toric uh, IOL and a monofocal with spectacles. Okay, so... Uh, it can be proven by in dollar. It can be shown in dollars and cents. So um, I also did my own simple one, wherein, um, and I'm not so sure if these costs are are correct because I showed this maybe two years ago, and these are the numbers that we have. So if you use a non toric lens, uh, after two three years, your costs compared to a using a toric lens, will be about the same. Okay. So um, maybe you can do your own uh, pencil pushing and see and prove me correct or wrong.
And there are hidden costs. No? There are hidden costs, benefits and costs to both patient and surgeon. For the patient, of course, it's better vision. You can actually measure that in terms of snell and acuity. But you can't measure the convenience unless you do a quality of life survey. Okay? And you cannot measure, as I said, the wow factor. And this is the, the wow factor that is important in establishing your reputation. When the patient is extremely happy about the, your results, it goes a long way in furthering your stature and your reputation as a surgeon. And take it from me, who has been in this business for 40 years, uh, this, there's nothing compared to a happy patient referring patients to you. That's some people think you have to go to the social media and bombard them with ads and all this. But the best way to build a practice is one by one. One happy patient at a time referring another patient and another patient until you get a geographic in increase in your practice. For the doctor, it's pleasurable. You can, you can charge higher because it's a, an extra skill. Uh, but again, you cannot measure how much of your reputation is being advanced. And you cannot measure how much you are differentiating yourself from the doctor next door who doesn't do toric or premium IOLs. Because eventually, word, word will get out that you're the one who does uh, these maybe more difficult cases or you have better results, quote-unquote which leads to increased referrals. What you lost by not learning the skill and not using the skill is that not only do you have a patient complaining why they still have to wear glasses, why their vision without glasses is less than what they expected, but you also cannot uh, measure what you lost to your competition, okay? You, you, can, you can probably estimate how many patients he gained and you lost, but you cannot also measure uh, how much fame that he got compared to what you got, okay? So an unhappy patient will not lead to any referral, and therefore that's a dead end, okay? So that's that, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows that, but this is something that we all need to, to understand. If you don't keep up, then the competition will just leave you behind. So what if cost is really an issue? Okay, you, you can do several things. You can, you can incise on the steep axis. You can do manual LRI, okay? But what you can't do is not do anything or not even discuss it with your patient. You can't do that because then the patients will eventually find out that they could have some, had something better, okay? And then you have no explanation why you didn't do it. So it's a matter of having a frame of mind, the correct frame of mind. When you talk to a patient, you have to be looking to correct the astigmatism and not deciding for this patient, well, he looks that he can't afford the toric IOL, so we won't even discuss it. That's not the way to do it. You have to inform the patient completely and then discuss with him what, what will work for both you and he, okay? So you cannot not do anything. That's the, that should be the main thing. And you should develop this frame of mind wherein you're going to correct it all the time by an IOL, by an incision, it's up to you. So in conclusion, it really does make perfect medical sense to correct pre-existing astigmatism in surgery. There is there are better optical and visual results, the impact on the quality of life and patient satisfaction is not even close to with to those who still have to wear glasses. It, it's very easy to learn, as you will see, 
through the succeeding lectures. And uh, it is a differentiating factor. It will put you head and shoulders above your competition. Okay? So if everybody else is doing it, you're going to be left behind. And in my view, and in my long experience, it is critical to success. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you for a very informative lecture, Dr. Caparas. Uh, I am sure many of you have questions after that presentation, and we will give you some time to think about them. To give you a clear insight, we will be addressing some of the questions you have sent through the comment section of our YouTube channel, of which I am sure Dr. Caparas is very much ready to answer. Please also fill out the attendance sheet posted on the chat box of our YouTube link to have access to our previous episodes and to be informed of the next ones to come. Before we move on to the next segment of this afternoon's episode, let us watch this short clip prepared for us by our sponsor, Alcon. This is an exciting lens. It's that thing we've been looking for for a while. They have entered the field in a dramatic way with something that pretty much blows everything else out of the water. No es que mejoró, es que se transformó totalmente. It made a great, great change in life. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, I could see things I never saw before. It would be my new go-to lens. I would write it 10 out of 10 in all conditions, whether it be not or done. It's just amazing. Encantado. Unbelievable. It's amazing. They've changed my life. It's, it's, it's a life change. It's the next step. It's been a long time coming. Two, one. Welcome back to our program. For the next part of this episode, we will go to the nitty-gritty of preparing for your TORIC case. This will be handled by my fellow Alcon Impact alumna, Dr. Keisha Doyunko Lenon. Keisha is a graduate of the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health, finished her residency and fellowship training in cornea, external disease, and refractive surgery at the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute. She is currently a practicing consultant at the said institution and a member of the Philippine Cornea Society. She is also a part of the Institutional Review Board of the Medical City. Keisha, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Um, today, I will be sharing some practical tips for patient selection and preoperative assessment for toric lenses. Okay, so I've organized this uh, lecture into five key areas. 
during preoperative screening. And interestingly, the brand um, Think Smart serves as a useful mnemonic. So not, not only is it a useful mnemonic, but, but it represents the kind of mindset one should have in refractive cataract surgery. As more and more patients demand excellent post-operative visual outcomes, knowing where to start and when to uh, begin offering toric lenses is definitely a must. So to begin, S stands for surface in ocular surface assessment. The importance of the ocular surface in toric lens implantation cannot be overemphasized. The air tear interface, in particular, serves as the first refracting medium encountered by light entering the eye. Patients with dry eyes do present with fluctuations in quantity and quality of vision due to alterations in the way the light is refracted in the eye. So similarly, light projected from imaging devices, such as your topographers, your biometers, may be altered during fluctuation of the tear film. And this affects the precision of measurements, which are crucial in toric IOL planning. In fact, several studies have shown that a shortened breakup time causes or induces larger areas, um, larger errors in keratometric um, measurements. Also, as more than 50% of patients for cataract surgery experience dry eye, the ocular surface must be addressed. Okay, so presented in this table are the most commonly used biometers in local clinical practice. All except the Pentacam AXL use automated keratometry for anterior K measurement. More specifically, these, measure, uh, these machines rely on light reflections of the corneal surface. As such, any changes in the tear film quality or corneal surface irregularity will influence anterior corneal curvature measurements. In addition to dry eye, ocular surface assessment should include an evaluation for any irregularities of the corneal surface due to scars, pterygium, or epithelial basement membrane disease. To avoid corneal warpage or masking of the true corneal curvature, um, contact lenses must be off for at least two weeks. And for patients using topical eye drops, these should not be used within five minutes prior to keratometric measurement as these influence the tear film and the accuracy of the values obtained. So M is for meridian and magnitude of corneal astigmatism. Accurate measurements of the meridian and magnitude of corneal astigmatism increase the likelihood of excellent outcomes. Moreover, it's not enough to know the values, but it's actually important to see the, the the astigmatism itself. So having an access to a topography or tomography device to understand the quantity, the quality, and the orientation of the astigmatism is highly important. As we already know, there are various ways to measure corneal astigmatism. So you have manual keratometry, automated keratometry, corneal topography. These are all devices which can measure the anterior corneal astigmatism. Corneal tomography, on the other hand, which we have in the medical city, um, can measure posterior corneal astigmatism in addition to your anterior corneal astigmatism. So what is the importance of posterior corneal astigmatism, or PCA, in toric implantation? So traditionally, the contribution of your PCA in toric IOL calculation was less known. However, in the recent years, studies have shown that PCA has a significant impact in post-op refractive outcomes. So um, as you can see, I'm illustrated here, um, the steep meridian of the posterior corneal astigmatism is actually oriented vertically. However, the posterior cornea is a negative lens. So the vertically steep meridian equates to a horizontally steep meridian in the anterior surface. Or to put it simply, if you have, for example, a posterior corneal astigmatism, this will equate to an additional anterior, um, anterior against the rule astigmatism. This additional against the rule astigmatism is larger in eyes with anterior with the rule astigmatism as shown here. 
So to illustrate this further, here is a topography of a patient with a 5.3 um, with the rule anterior astigmatism. So if you account for the PCA, the effective total corneal astigmatism is actually less. No, It's 4.4 um, diopters. Thus, if a surgeon decides to implant a toric lens based on a 5.3 with the rule anterior astigmatism, this can actually lead to an overcorrection or an axis flip after surgery. So you're actually inducing an against the rule astigmatism if you push through with this. Inversely, for a patient with a 4.2 anterior against the rule astigmatism, the total corneal astigmatism is actually higher at 4.8 after accounting for the additional 0.6 diopters against the rule astigmatism from the posterior cornea. Therefore, if the surgeon were to implant a toric lens based on the anterior astigmatism of 4.2 alone, then this would result to an undercorrection of the astigmatism after toric implantation. Okay. So another way to illustrate this actually is through the Baylor um, toric IOL nomogram, which was developed by the team of Koch after several studies on the PCA. So as you can see um, from the highlighted area on the table, there is a higher threshold for toric IOL correction for with the rule astigmatism. So here you can see that um, the recommendation is to implant a toric IOL, so an Alcon T3, for example, if you have a with the rule astigmatism of 1.7 to 2.19. However, for against the rule astigmatism, values as low as 0 0.4 um, diopters, a toric IOL is also recommended. Okay. So in summary, when measuring the meridian and magnitude of corneal astigmatism, always validate the K values that you get from your optical biometer against corneal topography or tomography. A difference in magnitude of less than 0 0.5 diopters and a difference in meridian of less than 10 degrees are generally acceptable. Patients with regular symmetric astigmatism, as you can see in the upper photo, are ideal candidates for toric lenses. In general, if you're starting, avoid toric lenses in corneas with irregular astigmatism. So this is really an, a contraindication to toric lenses. A relative contraindication are eyes with corneal ictasia. So those uh, eyes tend to have largely asymmetric astigmatism and also skewed radial axes, so as you can see in the lower photo. If a device that measures PCA is unavailable in your clinic, mathematical models which use a population-based estimate of the PCA are actually acceptable. So these are incorporated in modern um, toric calculators such as your Barrett toric calculator. In contrast, for eyes with corneal ectasia, um, prior um, corneal surgery such as penetrating keratoplasty or LASIK or PRK, it is highly recommended to measure the posterior corneal astigmatism, and the Barrett True K toric calculator allows you to input a measured PCA value. Okay, so next up is A, which stands for alignment in alignment and centration. So the accurate alignment and centration of toric IOLs determines the refractive outcome. So poor alignment of toric of the toric power along the visual axis actually induces astigmatism. It reduces the effective correction and even results in unwanted higher order aberrations. All of these contribute to poor quality of vision, which really renders a patient unhappy. One way of predicting IOL alignment and centration is measuring the angle alpha. So the angle alpha is rel a relatively new um, um, uh, measurement and this is the difference uh, or the distance between the center of the limbus and the visual axis and this can be measured by the eye tray system which we are fortunate to have in the medical city so displayed here are the range of values and any value higher than 0 0.5 millimeters is actually um, a warning that a uh, premium iol is not recommended due to potential problems in centration so to illustrate this further, here is a patient with against the rule astigmatism where the steep meridian is lined horizontally. 
Note that while the toric lens dots follow your steep meridian when you implant a toric lens, the actual toric power of the IOL represented by the red line is actually 90 degrees away. So for a patient with a high angle alpha shown in the case, so the angle alpha here is more than 0 0.5 millimeters, the visual center, which is represented by the red cross hair, is highly misaligned with the power axis of the toric lens represented by the red line. So this not only results, again, to poor correction of astigmatism, but induced higher order aberrations, particularly coma. In contrast, if you have a patient with, with the rule um, corneal astigmatism, angle alpha may not matter as much because the um, power axis will be oriented horizontally. So if there is a um, uh, high angle alpha, then this may not um, affect the visual quality or the refractive outcome that much. But for oblique or against the rule astigmatism, angle alpha truly matters. Okay, so as most of us are more familiar with angle kappa, this table just differentiates the two. Angle kappa, which is the distance between the visual axis and the pupil center, is actually more useful for corneal correction, such as as follows. While the angle alpha is useful for internal corrections, including toric um, against the rule or oblique lenses, and more especially your multifocal lenses. So aside from angle alpha, it's also important to evaluate capsular support as zonular, zonular weakness may render it difficult to orient and center a toric lens. Moving further, R stands for retina in retina and nerve evaluation. So basically, toric lenses are considered premium lenses. As such, these patients should ideally have normal eyes without macular or retinal pathology. So if, you, if you'd like, um, before you uh, recommend a toric lens, you might want to order a macular OCT or have the patient cleared um, by retina before venturing into um, this type of lens. Finally, uh, T stands for uh, time in chair time. So the last but one of the most important areas in preoperative screening is actually chair time. So generally, um, you'd like to avoid patients with highly unrealistic expectations and demands because after all, you're trying to deliver a refractive outcome. It's also essential to spend time to explain the lens to the patient. For example, it's highly critical that you inform patients that they need to avoid rubbing or wiping their eyes, especially during the first week post-op, as any outside pressure can increase the likelihood of toric rotation. Also, it's important to advise patients regarding the possibility of additional procedures um, for a toric lens, such as lens rotation for toric misalignment. Okay? So uh, chair time is indeed a prerequisite um, for you to have a successful practice um, with toric lenses. Initially, this would really take a long while, but when you um, streamline your discussion, it would uh, be a lot faster and you would be, um, be able to encourage more patients to go with this lens. Okay, so in summary, these are the key areas for preoperative assessment in toric lenses. And I do hope that this lecture encourages toric IOL implantation um, in your practice. So thank you very much.
Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Keisha. You never fail to amaze us with your comprehensive lectures. Now, before we proceed to the Q&A, let me share with you my journey as a cataract surgeon. Actually, I graduated uh, 2010 uh, from the medical city, uh, Department of uh, Ophthalmology. Uh, during my time as a resident, I haven't really used toric lenses. I usually see uh, Dr. Caparas uh, with uh, using the slit lamp, marking with the uh, gauge 27 and um, and the the markers that's that's actually the only time that i've uh, had the chance to see how toric lenses are implanted but uh so actually last year uh i was invited by dr caparas dr cheng and actually alcon to join the impact program to learn how to use uh toric lenses to my patients to better equip me uh, in my uh, journey as a cataract surgeon. So uh, I think it's been one year. No? Um, so uh, I think I finished it off with uh, the generosity of Alcon wherein uh, I get to implant toric lens to my patients and uh, as of now, I'm still uh, using some toric lenses to some of my patients. So there you have it. Uh, I hope you will also consider adding this skill to your arsenal as cataract surgeons. Now, let us call back Doc Vic and Keisha as we begin this afternoon's Q&A. <clears throat> So, so for the first question, uh, Doc Caparas and Tisha, um, is it advisable to implant a toric lens on one eye only, the other eye being monofocal, in cases of financial constraints? Ladies first. <laughs> I think, well, well, for me, um, I think uh, it would still be okay because at the end of the day, um, if you uh, take the refraction um, and let's say really reduce the astigmatism on one eye, but the other eye has a uh, um, small amount of astigmatism, it would still improve the quality of vision of the patient, regardless if it's just implanted in one eye. So I think I would still go for that. How about you, sir? Well, um, it's a monofocal, no? so um, it doesn't really, it's not going to affect your vision as if you're putting one multifocal in one and another. No? But if the patient has uh, equal amounts of astigmatism, they're going to see a significant amount of blurring in one eye. So as much as possible, uh, you want to correct as astigmatism in both eyes. Now, if your patient cannot really afford two lenses, maybe you should just try to do LRIs in the other eye. But uh, the point being, you should try to correct astigmatism where you see it. So thank you for that, uh, Keisha and Dr. Kapalas. Um, do, you have, uh, do we have other questions from our audiences? So, sir, if if ever uh, previously the patient is already implanted with a monofocal lens by another surgeon, I can mm -hmm. also put, we can also put, uh, for example, after five years, we see a patient and they need a toric lens, we can actually put the 
story claims sure. to that patient. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and before before we proceed, uh, it's a monofocal lens. Now, you don't call them monofocal and toric. They're both, they're still monofocal lenses. They, you just, we refer to yeah. them as non-toric and toric. Um, okay. Because we also have multifocal toric and multifocal non-toric. Okay? So, you, if, for example, it's a, the eye was done five years ago and did not have the, the benefit of a toric lens, well, then you just have to try to make the best by correcting the other eye as well as you can. And maybe you can even offer the patient other options to correct the other eye so that he, you're freeing him of um, spectacles, at least for distance. Okay, so the only spectacles he has to worry about are reading glasses. So the the options there are you can do uh, post FACO LRIs. You can even do um, uh, PRK to remove the astigmatism. Okay, so there there are other options that you can do. Um, again, it, it's developing this uh, intention to correct astigmatism. astigmatism. You, know, you don't you don't just leave it there and then assume that the patient will be. All right, or we'll accept it. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, I think the audiences have uh, heard that. Uh, so the next question is: In patients with dry eye, is it imperative to repeat biometry after dry eye treatment? If so, at what point? <clears throat> uh, I think Keisha will feel that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. So the answer is yes. I highly suggest that you repeat your biometry um, after dry eye treatment because studies have shown that um, all, uh, um, all actually all devices. So, for example, you're using IOL Master. So I, I've shown earlier that um, the keratometry is measured by um, reflective technology. So spots, light spots, or spot uh, light from the spots are actually reflected. On a, off the surface of the cornea. So imagine having a patient with dry eye getting the biometry. So you're actually um, not quite sure if the K values are actually um, accurate. Um, with regards to when to repeat the biometry, <clears throat> I would highly suggest um, that the clinician actually checks the tear film and see if the breakup time has increased, for example, because studies have shown that um, break up time of at least five seconds um, will render uh, repeatability and accuracy of your measurements um, as opposed to somebody who has a break up time of less than five seconds. So if you really can't see the patient, then maybe a good time would be to uh, after two weeks, but this will only be true for mild dry eye. So for patients with moderate to severe, I would still highly suggest a repeat clinical assessment for the ocular surface. Uh, let me add also, um, that, that's totally true, but let me add also that not all biometers are created the same. Um, the tomographers, meaning to say they take like the shine flu uh, machines like uh, the Pentacam and others, uh, are not as uh, uh, affected by dry eye or ocular surface irregularity as is uh, placido disc uh, biometers. For example, uh, the manual keratometer, the ones that they use on the autorefractors, and even the older models of IOL master. Okay, so uh, for example, at TMC, I always enjoin our doctors to use the Pentacam AXL because then you eliminate a lot of the errors due to the ocular surface. Uh, our IOL master is not the new OCT-based one, which is like a pentacam. Okay, so but and therefore you will have definitely uh, differing uh, K values in case your patient has an ocular surface problem. Okay, thank you, Keisha and Dr. Caparas. I think uh, we have lots of questions and this is a, another question from our, our audience. Does, does pupillary dilation interfere with toric measurements? Um, it will not interfere with the corneal uh, 
assim, <coughs> that is a measurement. But if if you're trying to determine whether there is lenticular or even retinal astigmatism, uh, it may it may interfere, um, and that's why it's it's very helpful. And I know it's not possible in many places. It's very helpful to have a barometer as well, because then you have a refractive type of measurement rather than a uh, placebo disc type of measurement. What do you think, Kish? Um, I just remembered, sir, from one of our lectures that uh, if you, for example, uh, order an IOL master, um, they don't advise that the pupil um, is dilated. I think it's because of the te technology, because light interferometry is used, so light is reflected from the machine to the back of the eye and back. And then I think if you dilate the pupil, um, uh, the mathematical computation is sometimes affected. So I'm not sure if, um, I think the pupillary dilation more affects the the HL length measurement, for example, or ACD. But as what Dr. Capras mentioned, it sh shouldn't really affect the K value measurement. It's really more the ocular surface that would determine the accuracy for that. Okay, thank you. Uh... Okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, so how do you approach the situation where spectacle history does not jive with K readings? Oh, that's a very good question. And that's something that we, we struggle <clears throat> with when we have these conflicting um, measurements, no? Um, you, you should go by what you can objectively measure. As, as you know, refraction is a subjective measurement. And if your patient has a cataract, it's very hard to determine which is better, no? whether it's this lens or this lens, this axis or that axis. And so it, it's not really that dependable. Yes, there is a disparity, but uh, you would probably sleep better if you just use an objective measurement such as what we get on the tomographer. And uh, if, you, if you have access to it, an barometer like an eye trace, and uh, you know that uh, you, you, if there is really a something else going on, like maybe lenticular astigmatism, it will come out. Okay? But that, that, that's also a dilemma that many will have. No? But in my case, I always go by the by the tomographer, by the tomography. Yes. Tisha? Agree. Agree with Sir. <laughs> so basically, I would also go for the K value from the tomographer. So if we're talking about toric lens implantation, if at the end of the day, um, we are still correcting corneal astigmatism. So the meridian and the axis of the corneal astigmatism, and the meridian and the magnitude of the corneal astigmatism. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let's go to the next question. The next question is for toric lenses, what are your results post-op? Oh, they're excellent. Or else I wouldn't be up here talking to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> they're excellent. And... <clears throat> But you know, uh, as as Keisha explained, you have to be very meticulous with your preparation, and uh, you know, as with all premium IULs, your your measurements have to be on on the money. You, know? they, you can't be um, uh, sloppy with your measurements. Uh, you should, if if in doubt, you should repeat them or even do it on another machine, as some surgeons I know do. So just to make sure that uh, what you're getting is truly the, the right. And then there, um, over the years, you will be able to figure out what your routine should be, as well as the various formulas for calculating the IOL is best in your hands. Uh, definitely, you should have your own optimized A constant for your toric lenses so that you get the very best possible uh, See, so the, the mindset that I'm talking about is not just of a cataract surgeon, but a refractive surgeon, which is what cataract surgery is now. No? See, so gone are the days where the, the only objective is just to remove the cataract. 
that that's that's the that's a given that's already the default see but we we have to go we, we're going higher already in, in in promising or ensuring that patients have excellent vision without glasses after that Isha? Well, in my limited, limited practice, um, I really mm. go by the rules that I mentioned earlier. So, in Think Smart, I actually uh, judiciously follow that um, mnemonic. So, um, given my limited number of cases, um, since I followed those um, guidelines, um, it, uh, the patients are, are generally all happy. So, that's why. Um, um, it's important for younger consultants like us to have that uh, confidence early on so that you are well motivated to continue offering toric lenses. So I think that's what the essence of this program is for younger ophthalmologists. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I think uh, we still have more questions from our viewers. Uh, so this is the next question. If with no access to topography machines, are biometry readings enough for preoperative assessment? Are there any other adjunctive machines that can be used? I think for us, we have Pentacam in Medical City. How about other institutions? Yeah, it depends on the biometer that, uh, <clears throat> that you, you have. No, So uh, right now, the most popular one are the optical biometers that we, which use laser interferometry like the mm -hmm. IOL master but we also have the shine flug ones like the lens star and uh, the pentacam axl no? so especially the IOL master oct uh, these are these three are in the same category no? these are very very reliable in terms of um, anterior segment measurements and as well as the hl length no? um uh definitely a a scan biometry is not as uh, reliable uh, immersion is pretty reliable as long as the technician who is performing it is uh, expert at it and get can get very repeatable results no? so in in many cases where we deal with very thick cataracts we can't get a good uh, biometry whether you use the IOL master or the Pentacam. So we rely on immersion. And I've gotten very, very good results uh, with immersion with the technicians that we have at the hospital. But it's key for the technician to be expert at it. Mm. To add to what uh, Dr. Paparas mentioned, um, for example, the institution only has one biometer. So what I would probably do is to repeat the measurement using the same device and see if the measurement is repeatable. And that would give me a, um, more confidence that the case are actually um, accurate. One, one uh, method that I also use when I uh, plan for patients in, uh, for refractive surgery um, I try to compare the K values and <clears throat> magnitude, I mean, in the, in the meridian um, from the corneal tomography and even just the automated keratometry from your AR um, um, machine. Um, if these values are consistent, then that also gives me confidence that most likely the K values are actually correct, provided that the tear film of the patient has been treated. So it really starts with the tear film. Okay, thank you for that. I think the discussion is going very well. Uh, we have more questions from our viewers. Uh, so, are, are patients with retina problems an absolute contraindication? For example, uh, ERM, status post feeling, or stable DM retinopathy. Can we implant uh, toric lenses to, uh, to those patients or um, offer that uh, option? Well, for stable uh, and mild diabetic retinopathy, I think there's no problem. Uh, a membrane might pose a different challenge no? because the, the membrane will cause a change in the topography of the retina. 
Uh, and I'm not so sure what happens after you peel it, whether it goes back to its normal topography or that you may have induced some retinal astigmatism as well, which you can't measure with your ordinary biometer. You may be able to pick it up if you use the nabirometer. Uh, and, and I've done it in one or two patients just to differentiate whether where the astigmatism is coming from. But uh, for diabetic, especially if it's mild and controlled, I have no problem putting it in. You might ask also, can you put it in a keratoconus? Yes, you can, as long as the astigmatism is, is uh, stable. Yeah. Yeah. Isha, do you have anything to add? Mm, reading about uh, toric lens implantation and the indications and the contraindications. Actually, um, what Dr. Capras mentioned are extended indications of toric lenses. So it's true if the if the case or the astigmatism is stable, then you can actually put it in ectatic, um, patients with ectatic diseases. For retinal pathology, it's still okay as long as you cover all your bases. So for example, uh, you tried to measure the patient's angle alpha, for example, and um, and then you, you noted that the angle alpha is normal, so decentration is unlikely. Then the, the less chances for um, the patient to experience more aberrations after putting the toric IOL. Because if you have aberrations induced from decentration coupled with um, a retinal pathology, then you would you can just imagine how unhappy the patient is. So it's always a case-to-case -case basis when you go for these extended um, indications. Oh, okay. Uh, I think we have a couple more questions. Uh, so, if I request a toric virion, what indicator do I have that the case are reliable? Uh, not disrupted by dry eye, aplanation, terigium, etc. So that I need a remeasure. Um, the 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 virion is is it a placido? That's a placido uh, um, instrument, ba? Yeah. I think, it, uh, sir, it's linked to the IOL mass. I think it's linked already to a machine. I'm not sure when we used before, it was linked to the IOL master. And then the K values from the IOL master are, are transferred to the Verion. Mm. But I'm not, not yeah. particularly sure. So it does not actually captures. measure the K. Yeah. No? It doesn't actually yes. measure the K. It's only for planning, yes. Sir. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, the so the the question is, so you would not use a virion. You would you would have your normal biometry done uh, by an island master or whatever other uh, biometer you have. But my tip to you would be, if you had a choice, use a tomographer rather than a placido placido disc. Uh, biometer because then your question about uh, dry eye and ocular surface aberrations will be more or less eliminated when using a tomography. Okay. Um, I think we have a last question, sir, uh, and Keisha. No? Um, okay. So for the last question, does a digital marking, does digital marking better address cyclorotation than the manual marker? Okay, uh, a digital marker like the Callisto or the Verion is, uh, it's, it's, it's for me, it's just really a convenience uh, because you don't have to do much marking on the eye itself. And as with the, let's say, the Zeiss machines, you can do it pre-op, plug it into the Callisto, and then you don't even have to uh, do anything the the marks will come out digitally already in your view. Um, same with the Viraya, no? But um, for me, there it's just like icing on the cake. You can still have a very good result by just doing uh, physical marking on the cornea. And the best method I know is to use a slit lamp and to mark it with a slit and a pen. Um, there are some surgeons who will swear by the uh, hand tools that made there are many, many, like the Mendes, K 
gauge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in their hands, it works the best. But uh, I have a problem with that because it involves having a patient sit straight, hold their head straight, look horizontally, and make sure that you're holding right and mark it. No, so there are lots of um, there are lots of um, factors that go into doing a correct mark. Having them sit at the slit lamp with their chin securely positioned there with their forehead pressed against the bar with a speculum in there you eliminate a lot of the variables so and uh, if you want you can buy a very inexpensive marker you know just press it on the eye and it will come out with very shallow marks on the corner and you mark it with a with a with a pen and you're you're good no? so um you don't have to have a digital marker. See, sorry to Zeiss and Alcon, but it's just for me. It's uh, it's icing on the cake. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have one more last question. Uh, for patients with tight eyelid, eyelids causing the astigmatism, uh, will you or can you give toric IOLs? Hmm. Well, um, as people age, there is a tendency to have a drift towards against the whole uh, astigmatism because of the weight of the upper lid on the cornea. So uh, if a patient with a very tight eyelid, you, I, I would first try to determine whether the tight eyelid is actually causing astigmatism. Um, to be honest, I've not really encountered any case like that. Um, but I will agree that if you have an eyelid pressing on the cornea, then it, it uh, theoretically can, can change the astigmatism. Okay. Um, how about Keisha? Do you have anything to add? Um... Well, I think um, if if you, when you do your repeat measurements and the astigmatism is stable and it's always present, and if there's nothing that you can do about the tight eyelids, then maybe you can just you can also just address the astigmatism of the patient because I don't think the tight eyelids will go away anytime soon unless you do something surgical on the lid. So I think it might still be an indication so again it's a it's a, it's something to discuss and um and to study further okay thank you um i think uh we have answered everything um if there are no additional questions we would like to thank once again dr vic and keisha for gracing us today it was truly a pleasure to listen to your experiences regarding toric, toric lens implantation i think the audiences enjoyed the topic very much with that much questions um we we have now come to the last part of our program which is actually a new segment in tmc itv this is called the tmc itv bulletin which will highlight events happenings and conferences in the world of ophthalmology i would like to welcome one of our residents dr rexel piad to give us a quick update on what to watch out for in the next few months Hello, so on behalf of the TMCI and Vision Institute, we'd like to thank you for attending this episode of ITV. It has been an exciting season these past few months and an even more exciting season to come given the many events that are opening up in the world of ophthalmology. So what an eventful time as more conventions and seminars are beginning to be more accessible for many of us. If you're interested in being a part of all of these great opportunities, you should know that there are quite a few conferences lined up for us. So first, 
um, the next slide, something to look forward to in the next month, actually, is the Uretina 2022 Congress in Hamburg. It's going to be a four-day event with panel discussions from clinicians and researchers from all throughout Europe. Abstract submissions are already closed, but registration for this event is still open. So grab the opportunity and register to attend. Uh, next up, um, after Hamburg, is actually in Milan, where the European Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeon, uh, Surgeons Congress, or ESCRS, will be held from um, September 16 to September 20. So abstract submissions are also already closed, but you can still register to attend. Our very own Dr. Victor Caparas will be one of the speakers for this event. So how very exciting. So if you want to hear that lecture live, grab the opportunity, book those tickets, and register to attend. Um, next up, uh, events are also beginning to open up for next year in 2023. So first, we have the Asia-Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology Congress in Malaysia in February. So for those interested, abstract submissions are open and travel grants are still being accepted. So get those papers in, book those tickets. August 29 is the last day of submission. So in 2023, we also have the World Glaucoma Congress in Rome. Here, attendees get access not only to scientific sessions, but also get access to ebooks and educational portals for continuous learning. So abstract submissions for WGC is open until January. So we still have time to decide and join in. The conference will be held from June 28th to July 1, 2023. And last and definitely not least, for those who are looking for something much, 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 much closer to home, in November of this year, many of us are looking forward to this year's PAO Annual Congress. So this will be held on November 29 to December 2. Finally, after two years of being online due to the pandemic restrictions, this year's PAO Congress will feature exciting in-person demonstrations and sessions. And of course, the chance to meet both old and very new colleagues. So we hope to see everyone there. So again, on behalf of the TMCI Envision Institute, we'd like to thank you for attending this episode of ITV. Exciting events are underway, hoping to see you all and learn with you all in these events. And of course, we'll see you soon in our next episode of ITV. Thank you and good night. So thank you for that, Rexy. As the pandemic wanes and the restrictions slowly ease out, it is really exciting to have the opportunity to learn and interact with our fellow ophthalmologists and industry partners through these conferences and fora. Again, please fill out the attendance sheet posted on the chat box of your YouTube link to have access to our previous episodes and to be informed of future episodes to come. We definitely have a lot in store for you in the coming months. For the second episode, we will go to the pre-operative preparation for toric cases. This will be elaborated on more by Dr. Lisa Yu Mateo. Do not forget to tune in on September 1, 2022, Thursday, 5 p.m. for the continuation of our Alcon Impact Program. Again, the webinar series is just the first stage in completing the program. After viewing these four episodes, interested ophthalmologists may contact Alcon for them to be able to explore implementing this program in various institutions, just as they have done here at the Medical City. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Caparas and Keisha for a very engaging, informative, and thought-provoking episode today. I would li also like to thank our sponsor, Alcon, and of course, to all our viewers for continuing to support us as we go three seasons strong. I am Dr. Glenn Angeles from the Cataract Section of the TMC Eye and Vision Institute, and thank you for tuning in to TMC ITV, Ophthalmic Instruction Without Borders. Good night.